Uh, today, as you can see from the slide, we're going to be talking about alcohol withdrawal. This is something that I've been talking about oh, going back to the, when I became medical director in the 1980s. Um, but things have changed. Uh, there's new research. Uh, we go to conferences and talk to doctors around the country as to how they're doing alcohol withdrawal. We put our heads together and we've come up with some new ideas. So I've kind of reformulated the talk. Um, wanted to kind of go through what alcohol withdrawal is like, what's happening to the brain, and how we treat it in 2015. Um, so to begin with, I want to talk about the importance of this topic. Why is understanding alcohol withdrawal an important topic? There's five reasons. Uh, the first reason is that minor withdrawal can progress to uh, major withdrawal if left untreated. Uh, second reason is that treating the withdrawal at an early stage, when they first get into the emergency room, when they're first admitted, uh, can prevent the progression to the real bad withdrawal. See, so if you hit it real quick, really hard in the beginning, that can be real beneficial. The third reason it's an important topic is that simply alcohol withdrawal can be dangerous. It can lead to seizures, it can lead to DTs, it can even lead to death. And I've seen a few deaths over the years simply from alcohol withdrawal. The fourth reason that it's an important topic is that it can be the first step in actually bridging the patient from their drinking to treatment to re long-term recovery. It's the first interaction. It's the time when the person is really saying, I give up, I need help, what can we do? So that's that first interaction of the treating community with the patient. And the last reason is that um, Alcohol withdrawal is important, it's common. 8% of hospital admissions are related to alcohol withdrawal, 8%, not, not pretty high amount. Um, mortality, the number of people dying from alcohol withdrawal in the hospital has decreased over the years because we have gotten better treating it, um, but it remains around 5%, so still 5% of people are dying from alcohol withdrawal. So I'm gonna start with a case presentation. This is an example of a patient that we treated here at the Fairview program years ago when we were in a different building. Uh, he had severe alcohol withdrawal and it kind of gives you an idea of what it can look like. Um, we treat it differently now, so ho now what happened to him shouldn't happen anymore, but uh, it gives you a good example of what alcohol withdrawal can look like. So this was a 48 year old man. He was drinking beer, he came from New York. He was a business executive from New York City, kind of a high power man. Um, he was drinking four to 18 beers per day. He, had, um, he was a lawyer, executive type. He was a secretive drinker, so we didn't know exactly how much he drank. Said four to 18, well there's a big difference between four and 18. Um, he had a previous history of withdrawal five years prior to this admission. Uh, and that required transfer to a hospital. So we knew he had a b bad withdrawal before. Um, they did an intervention, his family did, uh, four days before he came from New York to us. And for the four days subsequent, he locked himself in a hotel room, was drinking 24 hours a day, was doing cocaine, was doing Xanax occasionally, and not eating food at all. So he arrived at our unit on uh, January 18th at about 11.30 in the morning. Um, his blood pressure was good, 116 over 82. His pulse was 92. He smelled of alcohol. Didn't look bad, looked like a guy that just hadn't slept for a couple of days. So we started to give him Ativan. We used to use Ativan back then. That's a short acting benzo, which you'll, we'll talk about as the lecture goes on. And that's what we used to use and this is a good example of why we don't use Ativan as much anymore. So he needed 12 milligrams, that's a lot in the first 12 hours. Um, he remained alert, we were giving him the Ativan and that didn't put him to sleep at all, didn't even, didn't even make him take naps. He started mumbling, which isn't a good sign. He kept saying, I don't feel shaky. Um, he would sleep off and on. Um, so that went through that night and then the next morning, at 2.30 in the morning, he was up in his room. He was talkative, uh, talking to himself. He was shaky. He kept thinking at 5.30, he thought he had to go to a meeting. He was gathering papers in his room because he said he needed to 
confer with business associates. So obviously he was getting a little deluded, a little crazy. He started singing out loud in his room. They called me and I said, increase the Ativan to four milligrams every hour. That's a lot of Ativan. He said, uh, I'm in a Christmas program with my wife and children. Um, at 8.30, uh, he was missing, not a good sign. This was when the unit was not locked. People could go outside um, and he was gone. So we called security and they found him outside and brought him back. Um, he was extremely agitated. He kept saying he wanted to call uh, his business associates. He wanted to make phone calls. He had shakiness, he had a lot of hand tremors. He was starting to sweat profusely. Uh, he was very verbal, talking all the time, pacing between the room and the nurse's station. By uh, 12.30, he was hearing voices. He thought he heard a radio in his room. He was making movements with his hands in the air. Um, he would be sitting down and suddenly jump out of bed and start shuffling papers on his desk. Uh, by 5.30, 17.30, uh, he was starting to get hostile. Uh, he was so preoccupied with getting papers from Federal Express for his business meeting, so obviously he still was confused. Um, he wanted to make phone calls. He was getting hostile. By uh, 1900, th so 7 o'clock at night, he appeared to be settling down. He was still getting Ativan, 4 milligrams every hour during the day. Um, he went to an AA meeting, and the other patients there said that during that hour of the AA meeting, he was actually appropriate. So we thought, good, maybe he's settling down. So at 20.30, he was asleep, and I thought, finally, we got ahead of this guy. But only a half hour later, he was awake and more agitated. He started to go into other patients' rooms. Um, he woke up thinking it was the next day. He wanted to take a phone, he wanted to make phone calls to New York. The going into the other patients' rooms was a problem because those patients weren't too happy about it. Uh, he pulled pay piled papers all over the floor. He thought he was in New York. At uh, 2300, 11 o'clock at night, he assaulted a staff when he was restrained from leaving the unit. Then he went down the stairs into the parking garage, which was connected to the building we were in. And uh, down there, he grabbed a two by four and started to smash car windows in the parking garage. He was hallucinating. He thought people were attacking him. So they called an alert. People from all over the hospital, big guys came, and it took 20 men to uh, take him down. They put him on a cart, face down on a cart, and brought him over to the intensive care unit. Uh, he was screaming, spitting, kicking, trying to bite himself, trying to bite others. Um, they had to hold him down on this cart with leather restraints. Uh, we weren't even, they weren't even able to, able to get vital signs, weren't even to take his blood pressure. He was so agitated. So we ordered Valium. In the first uh, one to two hours, he got 200 milligrams of IV Valium. Even that didn't make him go to sleep. He was still screaming. Um, he required three to hold his arms so Valium could be given through an, inch, through, through an IV. Uh, he was a lawyer and he kept shouting, I'm going to sue everyone, I'm going to sue everyone. Uh, he was screaming at everyone to get out of his apartment. Um, by 3 o'clock in the morning, he was getting a little more cooperative. Uh, he was still lying prone on the bed, which means stomach down, which isn't the usual position for somebody in a hospital bed ICU. Um, when the nurses would give him water, he would spit it out at him, at them. Um, the nurses don't like to deal with people in DTs, as you can see. At 5 o'clock, he was able to be washed. Uh, he was asking for gin and vodka. He wanted to get dressed and go to his office. By 11 o'clock uh, in the morning, he was getting calmer. Um, he said that he thought that there was a cult after him last night. Um, he stayed there in ICU all day getting Valium. Um, he got 220 milligrams. By that night, he was starting to get agitated again. He wanted to get dressed again, so we switched him to something we don't use anymore. It's Versed as a short-acting benzodiazepine, and they gave it in a drip, which means it constantly flows in the body. 
Um, and that seemed to be settling him down, however. But he was getting a big dose, five milligrams an hour is a lot of versin. Um, his, uh, um, by January 21st, he was having a better day. And by January 22nd, he was transferred back to the uh, chemical dependency unit. Um, he still was in withdrawal for, withdrawal for a while. He did finish treatment. He doesn't remember a lot about uh, what happened to him when he was in DTs, but that's a good example of what can happen to somebody with no real medical problems, just a normal lawyer from New York who all he did was drink alcohol a lot and stop drinking alcohol. That's alcohol withdrawal, and that's what we need to treat and get good at treating. So let me talk about the physiology. What happens? What's going on in the brain when somebody drinks and stop drinking? Well, alcohol is a short-acting central nervous system depressant. Um, so withdrawal is a state of excitation beginning about eight hours after the last drink. That's when the alcohol leaves the body. There's no more alcohol in the brain, and they start to go through withdrawal. It's been described by some as being like the brain being on fire. Um, Excessive alcohol intake for even one week can lead to mild withdrawal. And if somebody's been drinking excessively for over a month, it can lead to significant withdrawal. Um, the overall level of the arousal in the physiology, the overall level of arousal of the brain is determined by the balance of two neurotransmitter systems. First one's the GABA, the GABA system inhibits the brain, slows it down, makes people sedated, makes people calm. And the glutamate and NMDA system, they're excitatory. They stimulate the brain, make it kind of wild. So those are constantly in our brain and in balance. When somebody drinks alcohol, they build up the GABA, they enhance the GABA, which makes the sedation. That's why alcohol is a sedative. They get relaxed, they get sedated, they sleep. Um, Alcohol also blocks the NMDA system, so it blocks that excitatory. So the balance goes in terms of sedation when somebody drinks alcohol. The thing is, if you constantly drink alcohol, if you're drinking alcohol a long time, the brain gets used to it. So it becomes tolerant, and it doesn't get affected by the inhibitory effect of GABA anymore. So then when the alcoholic stops drinking, the GABA is no longer stopping it, and the NMDA and the glutamate systems go crazy, and the excitation wins, and they go into alcohol withdrawal. So that's what we see. Also, it's not as simple as that, nor the noradrenergic system, the adrenaline system in the brain gets overexcited, and that contributes to the withdrawal. Um, so when the alcoholic stops drinking, as I've said, no GABA inhibition, glutamate and NMDA overstimulated, and increase noradrenergic activity. So there's this phenomenon called kindling. This is very interesting. Kind withdrawal changes the brain. Every time somebody goes through withdrawal, it affects the brain and it changes it permanently so that in the future, somebody is def going to be a little different. Withdrawal changes the brain so that each subsequent withdrawal is more severe. It's kind of like spraining an ankle. Once you sprain it, it's easier to sprain it again. Once you go through bad alcohol withdrawal, it's much easier to go through bad alcohol withdrawal again. And some speculate that this kindling, this change of the brain, causes the craving that alcoholics see when they get out of treatment, that the brain has changed and it's harder to stay sober. Um, that's why it's so important to ask, ask patients uh, about what their previous withdrawal experience is. So who's going to have bad withdrawal? What are the risk factors? Well, anybody with prior withdrawal complications, anybody that's had a bad withdrawal previously is going to have a bad withdrawal. Uh, anybody that has high tolerance, they can drink a lot and don't get drunk. That person would be a high risk for bad alcohol withdrawal. Anybody that's older, the older the person, the worse the withdrawal. Anybody whose blood pressure and pulse are elevated when they arrive on admission. Anybody with medical problems like pneumonia, coronary artery disease, liver disease, anemia. Um, how many detoxes have they had previously? A person that's had a lot is going to have a worse withdrawal. It's going to be at higher risk. 
Obviously, the quantity of alcohol, how much they drink, how frequent they drink. The use of sedative hypnotics, if they're taking benzos, if they're taking barbiturates, anything else, they're going to have a worse withdrawal. And the last one is, if somebody shows up in the ER and they're already shaky, they're already sweaty, they're already in withdrawal, yet their blood alcohol level at that time is greater than 0.1, they're, already, they're still legally drunk. They've still got to go down. Their alcohol level is going to go down and their withdrawal is going to get worse. So that's a definite risk factor. If you have more than one of those risk factors, then uh, the, withdraw the risk dramatically increases. And one of the uh, researchers, one of the doctors at the conference said that the thing that he looks for the most is an inability to pay attention and follow the course of a conversation. If you're talking to somebody and they just don't seem to be able to pay attention to you, that's one of the key symptoms, the best predictor uh, that somebody actually is going to have bad alcohol withdrawal. So what are the signs and symptoms of alcohol withdrawal that we look for? There's five stages of alcohol withdrawal. Uh, stage one is a stage of tremor. It begins about eight hours after the last drink. In this stage, this is the, this is the hangover stage. In this stage, the patient is alert. They're jumpy. They're easily startled. They're uh, very preoccupied with their misery. They're rude. They're, they don't want to eat. Um, the tr they get tremor. The blood pressure goes up. The pulse goes up. They get nausea and vomiting, sweating, cramps, diarrhea, uh, and they won't sleep. That's the hangover stage. Stage two is the stage of hallucinations, and that occurs in about one out of four of people that come in and are treated for alcohol withdrawal. The hallucinations are worse at night. Sometimes people can go straight from alcohol withdrawal drinking, and they don't get very shaky. They don't get much tremor. They just go right into hallucinating. That's been called alcoholic hallucinosis. Um, the hallucinations occur usually after a day of not drinking, up to eight days later. The hallucinations can be auditory, visual, olfactory, or tactile. The auditory is about 20% of them. Uh, they're usually only one ear. Uh, there's an element of reality to what they're hearing. Uh, like they might hear a radio or a train or a voice of somebody that they know. Um, unlike some of the psych